Welcome to the Embodiment Conference. This channel, Trauma and Social Change, it's absolutely the moment for that, isn't it? I'm Steve Hoskinson. I'm the founder of Organic Intelligence. I've been teaching in this area of trauma, embodiment, and social change for about 25 years. It's an honor, really, for us to be sponsoring this channel where we're going to hear a multiplicity of voice, all unique all unique contributors to our collective understanding of how to move from trauma and support then social change. Our unique voice in organic intelligence has something to do with a koan that I'd like to present to you, which is trauma means unintegrated resource. And that's a koan, and if you'd like and are feeling intrigued about that riddle, uh, then tune in to the post-trauma system development course that we are offering here, the coupon code that'll get you half off on that is enjoy. Now, enjoy this next presentation and we'll look forward to another meaningful time as we explore these topics, trauma and social change. Enjoy. Jean is the founder of the School of Unusual Life Learning. She also helped create and facilitate the Art of Dying projects in New York City and is the author of the effects of compassionate presence on the dying. I am delighted to be here with you today and I turn the mic over to you, Jean. Thank you, Leela, thank you so much. And uh, it's an honor to be here. I have never done the embodiment conference. And uh, even before this incredible year, 2020, I would always congratulate people whenever they showed up at a talk that had the D word in it. And we know what the D word is. <laughs> and um, in this year, death fears have escalated exponentially around the globe. And so to have 20 people willing to jump on and, and have this conversation, I, you all get a great congratulations. Um, the fact is this word unconsciously stresses us. Uh, that's been proven by a significant amount of research. And uh, Reminders of our vulnerability to dying are used many times a day uh, to manipulate us. Media, advertising, politicians, um, human fear uh, of this word is experienced daily by medical workers, hospice workers, uh, death educators like me. And it's even proven by the fact that I got a little red chili pepper on this talk for no reason other than the word D and <laughs> the word death. So, Anyway, just to get us started so that we're not in that place of anxiety, I would like to start with just doing a little centering breath work with all of you. And how I would like to do that is by having you imagine a point someplace in the center of your head. And what you're going to do is take a breath in. And when you do that, I want you to imagine that point dropping down as far as you can into your belly. And when you inhale again, having it rise back up. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm sorry, inhale and it's gonna drop. So breathe in and exhale, rising up. And inhale, dropping the ball. And exhale, rising up. And one more, inhale, dropping the ball. And exhale, rising up. And I want to ask you, even in that short exploration, if you feel a little more embodied or a little less embodied. And we're gonna do one more. And in this one, I'd like you to imagine just a little point or a ball right around your solar plexus. And what we're going to do is let that expand on the inhale as a sphere all around you and contract back into a point on the exhale. Okay, are you ready? So we're going to inhale into a big sphere all around and exhale, contracting back into the core and inhale. And exhale, contracting into the core. And one more, inhale. And exhale, contracting right back in. Now, I don't want to alarm you, but all of you that did that have just practiced dying. 
And I want to ask you if you feel more enlivened now than you before you took the breaths or less. The truth is your energy system knows all about the process of dying. Even as you sit here today, as you're breathing, it's not a foreign process. It's not trauma. It's fully a part of your embodiment. It's a part of your love, your presence and your life force. Your body knows all about it. And that's most of what I want to uh, get across today in, in this 45 minutes or so. As Leela introduced me, my name is Jean Denny. And aside from the things she said, I'm a somatic psychotherapist. I'm a death educator. And I'm also somebody who works on theories of life, death, and the body. And this has made me also in the travels of the last several years, the founding director of the little school I call the School of Unusual Life Learning. And there we try to make sense of whole life patterns, uh, uh, especially that about energy in the body. And I like to say a life that includes death. So I'd like to do a few things in this talk. One is something we just did, is explore how death is intrinsic to vitality and embodiment. I guess you got that from the title. That there's no life in the body without the consideration of life out of the body. We need death skills. I want you to become a little bit more aware of the primary and pervasive false dichotomies that run our cultural narrative. How much death phobia, death ignorance run the show of our psyches, and they do. And maybe help us see that this can be tremendously helpful and important to somatic therapies, but a whole lot more than that. And if we have time, we will touch on the more. So, um, I'm going to suggest that bringing uh, death forward intelligently rather than unconsciously, as we most commonly do right now, will make all the difference for our future. Um, so I thought one of the best ways to start the conversation today is to tell you a little bit about my own journey. And that's maybe the way that I will get in. I haven't been a somatic psychotherapist my entire life. Um, I uh, started as a bridge designer, actually. I had 20 years as a bridge engineer. And sometime around when my mother died, you know, when we lose somebody in our life that we're very close to, a spouse, a parent, a child, a sibling, the penny drops for us, maybe a best friend. And about that time when my mother died, it was like a, a big door opened. And I knew that there was a lot of life that I hadn't even considered yet. And I knew it was time to quit my career and uh, spent a couple of years sitting in a chair wondering what to do next uh, as I was tra training to be a therapist, uh, watching my children's bodies grow. I had four children and I started hospice volunteering. So I was doing hospice volunteering and somatic education simultaneously. Um, and I was an engineer. <laughs> so. Uh, it was pretty clear to me that these two fields needed to be in a deeper conversation than they were. Um, so I was putting children to bed at like seven or eight o'clock at night and going over to the nursing home in the evening, watching their bodies grow in the day, buying them larger and larger shoes and watching people in the nursing home's bodies change. I was a birth doula during that period. I was studying somatics and um, and I didn't realize that I was really starting to build an education of whole life um, that I'm still working on to this day. I uh, studied core energetics and I'm, it was a neo reiki in training, if you know that study. Um, and I'm profoundly grateful for it. Um, but I did have to notice that the life stages we were talking about in that training were pretty much exclusively from um, in utero to about eight years of life, maybe 12 or 25, if we really stretched it out. The point was to um, really, it was about sexuality, becoming, you know, working through your childhood development issues and becoming fully sexual. But it seemed to me that a lot was left out of the picture. And that wasn't just neo therapies. therapies. Um, oh, it was true of other body psychotherapies as well in our field. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, body psychotherapies. But uh, a lot's been done in these fields, but we pretty much 
focused on sexuality in early childhood. Later, we started focusing on pre and perinatal imprints, mainly from the infant's point of view, by the way, not the mother's or the father's. Then trauma, neuroscience, more recently, social justice, gender. Um, but still, aging, illness, and dying, which are profoundly somatic processes, grief, profoundly somatic processes, have few, if any, theoretical constructs for them. Even though these processes affect most of our clients deeply and ourselves, if we are working with people. So I was a bridge engineer and it was clear to me that a bridge was needed and um, that these two fields needed to be partners. So that's, that's part of you know, my story. So somewhere in that process of being trained of trying my ideas out and all of the creative work that I did and compassionate presence and all of that, somewhere in there, I started to do, um, get involved with death education. I started by first offering community programs uh, in my local town uh, because I was so impressed by how much consciousness broke open when you just ask these very simple questions like, what do you want for your own dying? Oh, <gasps> you know, nobody knew. And they needed support. It was a, these were questions that needed support and they blasted people open in interesting ways. And I thought it was amazing. But later I started uh, teaching uh, death and dying at a local community college or not community college, I'm sorry, Rambopo College, four-year college. It may surprise you to learn that um, in that class where I taught, death, the death and dying classes would fill and have waiting lists, no matter how many units of them they put in. And they would fill with people that were 20 something years old, primarily. Now that was my first real awakening um, to the other side of death exposure. On the one hand, we all knew about the inner recoil the psychic recoil that people have around talking about death or dying and what that can evoke. But there is the other side of it too, which is the longing that we also have to know more and to be fed actually by death awareness. Because we are starved for this knowledge actually, especially if you're young in this culture. So being a little crazy uh, in that class, in a way, I offered students the opportunity not just to write a paper or do a project, but to actually plan for their own dying at, as if they might die any minute. And um, almost all of them, to my surprise, took up the uh, challenge. Their parents, many of them were horrified, of course, that their child might be challenged to think about their own death, but, um, given enough time and some support, these young adults walked boldly through the choices uh, that they would have to make for themselves and emerged really victorious to a person. Some of the students went on to challenge their 50 something year old parents to do the same thing. I don't know how successful they were, but it was absolutely routine to get the most grateful responses from the most profoundly changed students, even in a college and academics. It was an initiation for them. And we have to keep in mind that indigenous cultures throughout human history have seen a contact with the realm of death as, as tremendously important to being solid adults, maturity. This was one of the things that, that was always required of people. So I went on, as uh, Leela said, to facilitate a uh, more esoteric program in New York City called The Art of Dying. And there we were doing things that were just a little bit edgier. Uh, we were talking about death doulas, which was new at the time, uh, psychedelics for death anxiety, Beth dead presence, alternative funerals, and so on, grief support. But there too, the students bonded intensely with each other in each class and reported profound relief and gratitude over and over again. What I learned in all of these programs was something um, that other death educators were also discovering, even in very traditional settings, like an academic setting, that death education itself catalyzed, released, relieved something in both body and psyche of the students that came in those classes. We have an or organismic uh, response to these teachings. In fact, our bodies need them. 
um, that students, I also discover students that study these things together bond with unusual ease, even across divides of age and life experience and other differences. Uh, much more than any cocktail party I've ever been to, any type of mixer, death is an incredible bonding agent. Um, in the somatically oriented school that I've been creating, um, we take the somatic part even further and we look even more at energy in the body. But there's a profound alleviation of anxiety, which is visceral. Cellular shifts in the body, greater ease, connection to others, in a word, vitality. Now go figure, you know, this isn't how we think of death. But let me just do a couple of quotes from just recent students and this is very typical. This is so visceral and important. It feels as natural as breathing. I am now much more alive, expanded and available for living. This experience revealed to me an inner rhythm that connects my soul, body, spirit, with the energy around and even beyond me. Life, breath, and the pulsation of my beating heart and the blooming of a flower are one and the same force. It's exhilarating. Now, I'm not sharing these because I'm saying much about the school, except that this is pretty typically what people experience. Something very profound goes on when people learn about death together. And that profound response is, to repeat myself, somatic. It builds communities. Or as more accurately, what I could say is when we expose people to ideas about death and dying, it can really go two ways. On the one hand, you can get um, the fragmentation into fear and projection, which we're seeing all around us right now in this very, very unique time maybe not so unique in world history, but to us. Or you bond into a tight group, open your heart and see each other more deeply. You couldn't have a bigger contrast, really. Um, to quote Stephen Jenkinson, uh, who some of you may know, he's very quotable. Death is a village making event when it's good and a village destroying event when it's bad. So death education is actually a really powerful medicine, I came to find out, and was always curious about why, what was happening. Um, but you have to know how to administer it, right? There's good death ed, which is supported and helps us feel more at home in the world. And there's the kind that evokes fear because we can be manipulated and divided when we're in fear. And that's what I would call death miseducation. And we have a lot of that right now in our culture. All, it's extremely pervasive and it's given subliminally in any number of ways in our modern culture, which I'm gonna give you just, just a sampling of uh, our, our, our social programming in just a minute. There are lots of reasons though. Even the fact that media, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, uses death and violence to uh, manipulate our behavior as consumers. There is a group of researchers, I'd just like to mention their name if you are following along here and have never heard of terror management theory, I'd really uh, recommend that you take a look at some of the work that um, Sheldon Solomon, uh, Tom Pazinski and Jeff Greenberg have done for the last like 40 years, studying people's response to being reminded that they're gonna die. And I'm not saying that they have done this so elegantly. They're mainly showing how people can be contracted to want to be with people of their own kind and sometimes even get violent. Uh, but this is not the only option is what I wanna say. It's not necessary to contract and be terrified and projecting and uh, uh, when, when we think about dying. It's not hardwired. It hasn't always been this way. It's really more like our bodies, which know all about death and dying processes and aging processes, have been held in the straitjacket of our mind, which really don't know very much about it. So in order to show you just a little for more about that, um, I'm gonna go to the slides and um, show you a few slides. You're gonna have to give me a minute um, to get there. 
And we're going to take a look at how much um, death awareness has changed in a short period of time. And sometimes we forget to take, uh, take note of that. So hang on just a second. Okay. While you're doing that, she asked us, we have a question for the names again. I have Sheldon Solomon, Jeff Greenberg, and who was the third? Tom Pazinski, and please don't ask me to spell that name. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Look them up, it will come up and uh, you, will, you will see it. Um, okay, hold on, I'm, I'm, uh, I just gotta get back to Zoom for a minute and see if I can share this, see if it's, there it is, okay. Now I do have this odd thing that I do, which I, I actually don't like to, to do my uh, slides in full screen. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna show them to you like this. It helps me uh, orient a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at a few images of death education before uh, 1900, and just to get a sense. I just selected from my normal slideshow to show you these. And um, one of the first things you gotta notice is that 120 years ago, uh, people lived in much greater contact with nature. And they were gardening, farming, uh, the majority of human beings on earth were probably doing all of these things in, in contact with nature and natural rhythms. They were also hunters and, and would be around death and harvesting things all the time. They would have a context within which to understand their own, um, their own processes. 120 years ago, this is kind of a stylized art picture, but this scene that they're showing, it would not have been that uncommon. And this is one of an ill child who may be dying at home. You see the father at the window, the mother sitting by. Um, lots of children died 120 years ago. And where they died was at home. Where old people died was at home. That was also where they were waked. And so imagine growing up in this environment, you wouldn't need a death education course. It might be somebody in your family dying, or you might see a funeral session, procession going by in the street, or see, have a wreath on your neighbor's door. Um, when someone died, um, just looking at this kind, looks like a um, prairie family funeral. Um, the men in this picture probably would have made the coffin. They would have dug the hole. The women in this picture would have washed the body, dressed the body, gotten everybody ready. Um, they, it was a family affair. Just feel that in your body, what it feels like to, to have a death in your presence. And I'm not saying it didn't leave people sometimes frightened or confused, but it was not considered alien. Um, it was, we understood ourselves to be, I think, more natural. Let's fast forward for a few minutes to 2020 <laughs> and to probably what was true for the students in my class in Ramapo College, uh, even in 2011. And that is that death having been pushed very much more out of sight, the elderly being pushed out of sight, um, not, I think something like 40% of Americans, only 40% have ever been to a funeral. Um, and so most of our death education is, is coming from places that are most likely using it to evoke a response for a particular reason, like they'd like you to buy something or feel something or um, for sensationalism ratings. So we have a lot of dramatized media death, right? I think that it's researchers know that if they show violence in a segment, they can sell more products on the break. Ever wondered why we had so much violence in our viewing? Um, the kids that came in my classes uh, played a lot of unrealistic video games and to die is to lose. End of story, game over, you know? Um, also, in my generation, we were exposed probably for the first time to these hyper-realistic, dramatic, violent death scenes from around the world, from wars, and so on. And they were very out of context, and these are hard to see. And yet, um, often, it was just you know, really hard for us to see. And then, I'm, just breathe here if you're having a response. <laughs> um, but this is, in fact, 
the way that we are getting exposed to death and dying processes. Maybe somebody uh, is finally in the ICU. Many more people are dying in the ICU now. And there you are. And the, and, um, or maybe you get the urn with the ashes um, after somebody has died and may not even have a context for what to do with them. Just take a breath right here. Um, these images and these experiences, I think you can feel, are somewhat uh, anxiety producing, you know? And all of it in our time leads to a certain conclusion, which is death equals trauma. That is certainly the way the 20 something year olds came into Ramapo College death and dying class. Okay. Okay, so there's another stubborn and false a stubborn idea, false dichotomy, I say, that I think rules the world and our unconscious minds. Uh, I call it the mother of all wrong ideas, the idea that's responsible for a lot of distress in our world today. That's why I'm a death educator, and I'm going to give it to you in just a second. And you might, I wonder if you can guess what it is. But it's this idea that we rarely question, and that is uh, life versus death. And we tend to idealize the life side of this equation and we pile up all good things on life. Life is good, life is bountiful and, and that's everything we want. And on the death side, uh, we, we kind of project all of our traumas and, and difficulties and so on. And you can probably feel just from this picture, the kind of um, tension that exists between these two states that we consider to be opposing. And we learn it this way. And when I teach my other students, I, we look at like just how science is defined life, in fact, as opposite of death. And it, it, it is really is an idea that we need to take a look at because it leads very definitely to this experience. It creates terror. So imagine if you were in these ships in this picture, and uh, you came, you were going over the edge, you would be freaking out, wouldn't you? Of a sharp edge, not knowing what was on the other side. And that is pretty much how most people arrive at their uh, death processes in our, in our time. And it leads to the scenes we were just looking at, um, where there is a sharp edge. And uh, please breathe when you see this, okay? Now, I'm showing you that because uh, most of my 20 year old students in 2011 were educated in this and they thought that the statement was true, death equals trauma, and we're educated in that. But I really wanted to give people a different sense that reflected more of what I was actually seeing in, in my work. When, uh, and remember that I had been tracking this. I had been looking at the whole lifespan. I was looking closely at that, the profound continuity of life. And also this, what you'll see in the lower left-hand corner here. Um, here, I'll go ahead and make it bigger. Which I was thinking about energy and the body and what really happens in dying and so on. So um, I, that's what I had on my mind. And I wanted to know how could I help them approach death without trauma? So I um, had an idea that one of the reasons that we are so freaked out about death is not really death itself. It's that we have the image of it as being a sharp discontinuity of life. And that scares us. But when we start to consider life, not as a fact of the body, but as the energy that moves and animates the body, and energy that moves maybe in and out of a body with continuity, it helps. It helps a lot. And so I, I thought of uh, utilizing nature to help me teach. And uh, I, I thought of that, how could I help students in an academic setting get a feeling for life moving and the continuity of life? I'll use time-lapse video. This was a great uh, idea, I thought. It turned into a, something of what I call an unintended, unintended cultural research project for, and um, I thought I, because plants stay, stay stationary and they change really quickly that, that we could really see life moving. And um, Courtney, if you wanna uh, throw up the um, first video, uh, I'm gonna show people 
really what it was that I found when I started looking for videos that would show students continuity of life. Can you pull that up or is she there? I'm here, just a moment. Terrific, thank you. So um, just watch this closely. You're going to see life moving and plants are so generous. And just notice what you're seeing and how you're feeling as you watch these. Really seeing life moving. And I'd like you to notice, and if any of you wanna come in and comment, I'd like you to notice what you notice about the videos themselves. Is there anything that you notice? about how they've been taken. Well, I don't know if you can come in and talk, but I'm gonna tell you what my students usually say about this time and it's really wonderful to watch the all of the transformation, right? They're only showing half of the process. Thank you from Nicole. The videos don't show the other half. Thank you, yeah, you guys got it. They're cutting, right? And you can cut here um, and come back if you want, Courtney, thank you. Yeah. Um, whoops, there we go. I don't think I'm screen sharing right now, right? Can you see me? Yeah, so what I call this the bloom cut, bloom cut, bloom cut. Now, I have to tell you, there were like, 350,000, well, I didn't watch all of them, but, but really there were so, so, so many, and all of you can check this, although it, consciousness has changed since 2011. So many flower videos that showed flowers blooming. And for some reason, every videographer knew to cut the, the uh, videotape exactly at the moment that the flowers at their greatest expansion. I don't know how they could have known that if they didn't all sign a contract, except it was a social contract. And that social contract says, I won't show you what happens after that. Something, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Now, that was kind of a revelation for me. I was kind of like, whoa. <laughs> and um, so let me just see. I, I also noticed that you could get dying flowers but they were also presented dif differently. And there might've been 10,000 of those. And they, they were almost always dying flowers in a vase that had been cut from their uh, you know, plant roots. And there was sometimes very melancholic music or even philosophical things like, you know, life is short at the end. And it seemed as if we needed therapy to watch these and uh, and it was, so, so what I wanna say is it was something like this. I noticed that within these flower videos, we were getting a full picture of what it is that's operating in our culture all the time, which is sort of like dancers leaping up and never seeing them land, which produces a kind of anxiety, right? Inside of us, what happens up there? What happens then? Or dancers who were, uh, only we only saw them do crash landings. And so if we see that over and over and over again, just one side leaping up buoyantly and the other side crashing down, what we put together is that something really bad happens in the middle or something we can't handle. And honestly, as a therapist, that's how I see most everybody dealing with aging and, and thinking about dying. It's, uh, so if you follow this, I really saw in these flower videos, the outpicturing of our social imprints and what we've been taught. Now, there was fortunately one video that I've used a lot to help people see just a little bit beyond the corner. And Courtney, if you wanna load up the, the second video, I'd appreciate it. So I'm going to narrate this and you're going to see um, this videographer is 
being much more impartial, but you'll still see this person cutting it. But which way, I'm gonna ask you some questions and you can either type it or say it, but which way is, I wanna ask you which way the life force is moving and whether you could tell which way the life force is moving. Almost nobody up, yep. Almost nobody has trouble with this. Nobody has trouble tracing it. Other directions? Uh oh, look at what's happening at the bottom and out, up and out. How about down? Also up, out and down. And notice that there are some things happening at the bottom of the plant there. Oh my God, oh my God, let's try to save those leaves. We know that we don't need to save those leaves, right? Why? Because the force itself of life is moving upward, right? And they're, they're complete. Somehow that's not traumatizing. So now we're going to get up to what I call the adolescence of the plant. The plant, the flower is going to, uh, the plant is going to have a flower in just a second, and you're going to see turbulence. Um, and the life force has a lot of movement, especially right around adolescence, as I say. Um, And pal, here it comes, the bloom. And then he cuts it, but we get to see the rest. And so this flower, it has a life and it continues to unfold and change. But after a while, something else starts to happen and notice the leaves, things are moving and the energy is changing directions again. And where is it going? Ask yourself where life is going. Down, yeah, and maybe in, wilting, yeah, in and down, maybe back to the roots, yeah, and just notice how you're feeling inside as you watch this. We all know the movement of life, don't we? Yeah, maybe into the seeds, life is going somewhere. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Gosh, I don't think I've ever shown that sequence and not had verbal feedback from students. Can we stop for a second and just see if anybody is feeling anything about that or wants to comment? No? Just do it in the chat. Um, yeah, it is, it is powerful. And what that video and all flower videos really, if you really get to see the full movement of life, is they re we really resonate that with that in our bodies, don't we? We know that movement because we do it too. We do it too. The problem is we have been so denatured and so taken out of our ability to recognize ourselves as in this process. We don't even recognize that we are in a process of life moving and um, that we're actually possibly safe in that movement. In that uh, movement, I'm just gonna jump back to the slides, see if I've got anything else here I need to uh, share with you. I guess what I wanna say is that uh, pulsation defines not life, not, the, uh, not being in the opposite of, opposite of a dying state. That doesn't define life. Dying is fully a part of life, right? And, um, you know, of course we have our life pulse and to acknowledge this, itself is to allow the life within us to move and be recognized. Okay, so I think this is a great time to just stop for some questions if um, anybody um, has them. Um, Lula, so I'm available. Wonderful, okay, we have, um, I have some in the Q&A, but I wanna ask if any of the panelists would like to have a question that they wanted to ask live right. first. Comment. Go ahead. Hey, um, I am a hospice social worker and I'm struggling right now with COVID because I can't get in to see my patients yeah. in the care center. And so I'm just over the phone. And so what can I do to support them somatically well, over the phone? Yeah, Henty, this is hard, right? I mean, I was never in that situation. Uh, but one of my good friends, uh, um, 
Amy Cunningham in Brooklyn, who um, during the COVID thing, and, and she's a funeral director in New York, and I asked what I could do, and she goes, Jean, remember that presence route? Could you write something for the families that are not able to be with loved ones? And I wrote a little guide, and I, I, I would just refer you to that, and and it's on my website, and I'm, if you write to me, I'm happy to share it with you. It's just about how we can do things at a distance. And it really is different than reaching out and touching a hand, but it doesn't mean we can't do anything. It's really more energetic and we can be more intentional about how we care for people at a distance. So uh, I'm happy to offer that to you or anybody else um, on the call. Yeah, and it's really, your heart does all the work, your voice, um, your regularity and um, and just being willing to give give focused attention. Thank you. And thank you for what you do. Yeah. Thank you. It's nice to feel like there's something I can do. I think there is. I think this moment is calling us to activate different ways of being present with people. So uh, I offer that. And, and anybody else? Any of the questions from the chat or? No, please go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, the, the uh, somatic experience of pain as people get older, obviously pain, there's just more pain, you know, I, uh, but um, I have always, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily young, I'm, I'm pushing 50 and there, there's more pain every day with new things. Uh, in fact, I was just going to journal that exactly this month i started feeling pain in my knuckles which i never did before yeah. um but uh for me i don't i have learned not to associate pain with fear um i consider it a guide uh, but i have an aging mother who is very afraid of pain every mm -hmm. every pain just really um frightens her and um not, none of the stuff that I've learned about myself or the way I, I you know, uh, uh, console others seems to, seems to permeate to, to her. So I was wondering what, you, what um, input you might have. On. Well, that's not an easy one uh, uh, to just wrap up with but, uh, here. But I would say pain can be about a lot of things. And I think if you know anything about trauma, uh, the more we focus on things, the more painful they get, the, le the, more, the, more, the less healing happens. And so um, sometimes it's about pendulation between, it's about fear of leaving one state behind and, and uh, also pendulating into different energies, sort of like we were just talking about with Andy, you know, just different consciousness states can sometimes take us out of pain, weirdly. Yeah. And you see people struggling with that in hospice a lot. I, uh, pain is a very big question about what it is and how we respond to it. Um, but maybe I could um, say more to you about that in another context, but uh, what your mom might, but, but yeah, not to get obsessed with it is the most important thing. I mean, thank you very that. much. Yeah. 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 Okay. We have a question from Aaron. Well, we have a question. Let's start with Aaron. Um, I am curious about the process of dying as opposed to death as a final state. Mm -hmm. My mother has Alzheimer's and it is a slow and laborious process of death. Yeah. Alzheimer's also seems to be deeply tied to identity. And when I talk with people who have very little experience with Alzheimer's, it is often framed as a two-part death, the dying of a personhood, their character, yeah. and then the physical death of the body. Yes. I also find that people's assumption on the death of a person's character identity is part of what drives the progression of a disease like Alzheimer's. The expectation of what Alzheimer's is drives people how drives how people react to it and I think also ends up driving how a person progresses through Alzheimer's. So I hmm. think my question is to ask what it means to hold a person dying in their non-physical body. How do we support those who are in a state of fundamental change that is not necessarily tied to their physical bodily death? Well, 
this is a big question, of course. Uh, losing identity is part of almost all dying. I mean, you know, there are sudden deaths where we really don't have time to do that. <laughs> but, and then these really long ones where we spend a lot of time without our identity and consciousness. But there are many aspects to dying, not just the bodily, and, but they do go hand in hand to some extent. And, and I'm not sure if I understood the question entirely, but it sounds like having a, a larger view of what, what it's like to hold these energetic changes is what this um, person is asking about. I would say that really um, looking at these things as energy has really helped me. Um, watching bodies and energies change together, watching consciousness change and putting all those pieces together has helped me. Alzheimer's is a really tricky one, right? And all I might be able to offer that right now is that uh, wherever, is maybe we can get curious about where this person is. They aren't nowhere. It's not like they're nowhere or they're nobody. The identity always has to fall away. That's part of dying, okay? But that doesn't mean we're nobody. And they are somewhere, right? And to, it's very hard for children, I think, to, to live with this, but it's a lot easier for volunteers and so on to just engage with people where they are and learn something about where they've gone and work with the energies, even if they aren't making sense to us anymore. Um, but sometimes they just say the darndest things and amazing things. So I, I know that there's a lot more going on there than the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. I hope that's of some help. I think so. And I think, it, I think that what you've been talking about too, about the pulsation, yeah. right? Of what comes in and out and, and yeah, yeah. So God bless her. So uh, Leonora asks, Leonora, Leonora asks, and this presentation is from a Western lens or context, question mark. Oh, is that a question about the Western? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, 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 that's a really interesting question. I'd be curious about where, where she's from. Yes, in a way, uh, being that um, I think that, that my work around energy in the body uh, is trying to bring a crack, uh, crack the shell of the Western left brain idea about life open so that we can have more of a bicameral left and right brain idea of what life is. And we have to start sometimes in the language of Western ideas, but, but really the point of what at least I'm trying to do is look with beginner's mind and let the body teach us just like all indigenous cultures and Eastern work has done. Um, I didn't, I mean, I do, I did train with the chakras and all of that. Um, and um, I'm very interested in what happens to them through the dying process. That taught me a lot, those questions. But um, I think I've been trying to make sense of it from my own culture and trying to interpret it to people in this culture so that we can begin to bridge and not just say, well, this is what the guru says, but also work out of our own culture to um, have a more balanced um, view. That was beautiful, especially, and you know, that just tied it right back for me to that you were a bridge builder yeah. <laughs> before you began this it just work. It keeps coming up everywhere. I go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that um, speaks to a certain um, flexibility and ability to translate um, that not everybody has. And I think you're really doing a beautiful job with and um, the openness and the space that you have brought out, there's someone in the chat was saying, which I thought was really beautiful, um, that in Ghana, um, in Ghana, Africa, the tradition is to make coffins, reminding of who the person who died was, like oh, a fish yeah, for a fish those are amazing. Their There's so, so, so many cultural traditions um, that are yeah. fabulous and it complicated and, and, and it thrilling and, and, and that help people so much for us to learn from. Um, it, yeah, it's a contradiction, right? Because there are really cultural aspects to this dying and, and grief thing. But what I think I'm trying to focus on is the organismic reality, the energetic language. We all pretty much are born and die the same way. That is our human language. 
our human development to some extent, it's of course it's mediated by culture, but our de physiological development is a language we can learn to read again and understand each other again and see deeply each other again. So, uh, yeah, I see somebody read Dios de los Muertos. I mean, uh, the Mexicans just, ah, it's so great to teach down there. So um, we have a lot to learn from everybody all over the world. And, and we can start by using our own bodies and start including this work in somatic work and yeah. break the silence around this because it is full of life. That's why those skeletons in Dios de los Muertos are so wild and so amazingly full of life. We know the truth in that. So uh, Leela, I know you had a couple of things to say. I would just like, could I just make a couple points? And, and Please, absolutely. Yeah. You have a couple uh, minutes well, before I'm... Yeah, okay, great. So I just wanna leave you with a quote uh, from Thich Nhat Hanh and, uh, and uh, a few just summary ideas for you to remember that death and trauma are not identities, that life and death are not opposites, that any new paradigms for vitality for any part of our culture and our world must include this death idea. And incorporating aging and dying into life concepts in somatics creates radical and necessary shifts in perspectives on the body and healing. Um, it's really time to build some theories that incorporate aging, dying, and whole life to growth and the role of the village in our work. Um, so here's the quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, One of the ways to touch the world of no birth and no death is to touch the world of birth and death. Your own body contains nirvana. Your own body contains nirvana. If you go deeply into it, you touch the ground of your being. So thank you so very much. And if any of you are interested in the kind of work we're doing, I know a place where you can do that kind of study. So thanks so much. And Leela, thank you. Well, and I assume you mean your website is how we can find out more yes, about yes. that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. School is still on my website, just jeandenny.com and uh, look under the school. <laughs> You'll see okay. a little bit there. Terrific. We're, we're still working we're, on our website, but it, it, it's a very exciting thing. Yeah, absolutely. Websites are a work in progress. Um, I, <laughs> I am no matter, but that people can find out more about the work you do and the, and the work you offer for them uh, to learn more about in the website. That's terrific. I want to thank you. Um, that is very, very powerful for me. And um, I had a de I saw in the chat a couple of people that have had a death in their family recently, and we've had one in our family recently, and it is uh, very relieving to yeah. see it in in this context and this beauty. Yeah. And so yeah. I am grateful. So um, much to learn. So much to learn. Much and, to learn. And uh, go ahead. Well, this killer question came in like right at the end. It's like, oh, we can't answer that really great question about the chakras. And but I'm going to point everyone to your work because I know yes, you have. Yes, you do work with that. that there. <laughs> yeah. So and and I, I just have to ask: Is your book someplace that um, that that particular? Uh, please don't buy that book. Um, <laughs> what I want to say is that there's a, it's owned by a German publishing company that charges too much money, and it and I can get you the 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 information uh if you just reach out to me uh it, hopefully we're going to be making it into a to a new book that can be actually sold and but it it's about some work i did with people who were in non-community of states uh close to death um and uh, wow. measuring their heart rate variability and so on and and, and the communication that oh. was happening and this was this was a number of years ago so there may be much better work on this at this point but um the guide uh, and a couple of articles. I, unfortunately, I'm not really easy to, it's not easy to find stuff in blogs. That's where you can find it. They're all on the website. And I'm happy to share if you just reach out to me. Oh, respect. thank you so much. That's very generous. And I know we're all grateful. Um, we can also continue the conversation uh, on the Facebook channel and on the portal at the coffee break area. That oh. is actually a very nice area. A lot of times people go after the show and, um, and of course, on Jean's website, that's jeandenny.com. Okay. Up next in the Trauma and Social Change channel, we have Patricia Vickers with Northwest Coast Indigenous Beliefs and Healing. That's gonna be wonderful. Um, 
And you know, the something I usually say at the beginning of every um, program that I didn't say today is that it's amazing to me that we're coming together from all over the world uh, in this effort to come more deeply into our individual selves and, and the, the paradox of these things and this, these two intents at the same time. And I think the paradox of um, you know, the life-death relationship is, as it really truly is, that wholeness is, is pretty exciting to be a part of. It's such a broad and vast um, body of work that's available on this embodiment conference. Um, I'm just grateful. I want to say thank you to all of the organizers who have put it together and one of the ways we can say thank you is considering purchasing the library. What's wonderful about the library is not only do you have access to all the talks, uh, which can be a little overwhelming, but they have put learning lists together. So for example, in the death and dying category, Jean's not the only person and they will um, make a learning list so that we can go through it in a logical order and build our understanding and our knowledge over um, in, in the cadence that allows it to build on itself. Um, so if you have the means to do that, I encourage you to do it because it is what allows the presenters um, a worldwide audience and, and let these beautiful concepts go broader and broader. If you don't have the means to do that, please enjoy the conference for the 48 hours after each present presentation that it is still available. Um, there was one other thing that I am supposed to say and I can't find it in my notes. So. I'm going to go to our last question for Jean, which is, <laughs> Jean, what is your top tip for helping people stay more embodied? Or be more embodied? <laughs> well, given what I'm talking about tonight, I'm going to quote uh, Plato, who is reportedly on his deathbed when his students wanted the last pearl, said two words to them, practice dying. That will help you be embodied, practice dying. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all of you for being here and so present. It's been a pleasure, really. Cheers, right. everyone. And how do I get to this uh, chat room? I, I wouldn't, I don't mind. Uh, going oh, there, but okay. Uh, yeah, let's, um, let's get you that. That should be, uh, let's see, it's in the chat. So okay. Um, okay, great. if you can see, yeah, Courtney has put the Facebook link, um, but so the coffee break link is where we want to get oh, you to. Okay. Um, cool. And if you go in there, I'm sure. All right. Awesome. You might okay. have to log in. Thanks so much and good to meet you, Leela. Wonderful to meet you. All Thank right. you. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Good night, everybody. Good night. Mm -hmm.